Hello, everyone. You can all sit down. So, hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us at the 2024 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Cameron Russell, and I'm a first-year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. It is now my pleasure to introduce our panel today, Competing on Sports Ownership. Our panelists here are Jerry Cardinal, Founder, Managing Partner, and Chief Investment Officer of Redbird Capital Partners, Rich Kleiman, Co-Founder and CEO of Boardroom, and Long-Term Manager of Kevin Durant, Steve Paliuka, CEO and Founder of PAGS Group, Co-Founder and Managing General Partner of the Boston Celtics, and Co-Owner and Co-Chairman of Atalanta. Now, our, our panel will be moderated by Contessa Brewer here from CNBC. In terms of logistics, the panel will run for 45 minutes, and we're going to leave 10 minutes to the end for questions. Please submit any questions that you do have via our Cadence app, in which you can navigate to the panel via the schedule pane in the menu and move to the Competing on Sports Ownership event. Questions can be submitted throughout the panel in that event and will be selected by the moderator. With that, I'll turn it over to Contessa. Thank you. Thank you, Cam. Hi, everybody. Great to see you today. Thank you for being here. Uh, I got to say, when we're talking about team ownership, it's an exciting time to be diving in because team valuations are soaring, fan engagement is overwhelming, and also more people than ever are getting a chance at taking a little bit of the action. Uh, Jerry, maybe I'll start with you and just talk to me a little bit about how team ownership is transforming. Well, look, I mean, I, this, those, those attributes around sports have been there from the beginning. What's, what's happened, though, is that capital has now found sports. Uh, there's been an evolution in team ownership, to your, to your point, and these are, there's a transition going on where these you know, have gone from being hobbies for wealthy people to you know, multi-billion dollar live event entertainment companies. And you know the the forms of consumption and distribution for this content is evolving and changing, which is you know further proliferating and distributing uh, this content out to more people. Uh, and the way consumers or fans want to consume this content is changing. I think for the positive. I look at technological disintermediation as a positive. I don't look at it as a threat, uh, but it does mean these these the way you own these assets. Uh, needs to evolve and change. It needs to be more professionalized. And that's, I think, what you know, the people you see up here, you know, they get that. And that's what we're trying to do. You own a lot. Fenway Sports Group, Yankees Entertainment and Sports, the Yes Network, XFL, AC Milan, Mumbai, Legends Hospitality, the list goes on and on. Is the money that you're investing in other investors driving the valuations higher? Or is the money coming because the valuations are That's higher? That's a good question. It's chicken and egg, but right now I personally think uh, there, there's, there's been a bubble in sports for some time. And I also don't think that's necessarily that bad of a word. It, the bubble just simply means that you've had this massive escalation in valuations. And I just don't think that the people or the infrastructure supporting that has kept pace. And so, you know, I think that ultimately, you know, there's a lot of facile notions going on about sports teams. When people think about investing in sports, they think about owning sports teams. My career has been not that until recently. My career was investing in partnership with rights holders and building terminal value businesses, monetizing the economics of that IP. So the Yes Network, Legends, On Location, Everpass, um, you know, one team. Um, what's happened now is that, you know, now I hear, I start to hear these things. I'm sure Steve and Rich have heard this too, which is that, you know, everything keeps going up. It's non-correlated to the macro. If you compare it to the S&P, it's outperformed over the last year. And so that's all of a sudden now attracted, you know, capital that hasn't been around sports. And so that capital jumping in, and that capital, it's not so much that they're enamored with sports the way the people up here are and, and have had the longevity uh, investing in it. It's just more that they're looking for that exposure in their portfolio construction. And when that starts to happen and they start to refer to sports as an asset class, that's where this thing gets a little tricky, at least for someone like me, because I don't think sports is quite ready to be an asset class. It certainly has the potential, but we got to close the gap in terms of the, the underpinnings of the people and the infrastructure and the professionalization in which these are owned and monetized. And moving these things, frankly, as, as certainly in the European football context, from a multiple of revenue to a multiple of cash flow. When that starts to happen, then we can start to talk about asset class. It's a little bit ahead of itself. Uh, Steve, you have not only your co-owner of the Celtics, but also an investor in Italian 
sports as well. When you're looking at the valuations, um, give me a sense of how that, what kind of a hurdle that puts in for people who are interested in investing in sports, and also what kind of opportunity exists? Well, um, if you go back on the, on the history, go back to the Celtics uh, about 21 years ago, the purchase price was $360 million, um, and uh, we put together a group. We were one of the first people, I think, that put together a group to do it, to uh, of community. And we thought at the time, honestly, it was a community asset. It was a group of people that wanted to win, bring championships back to Boston. So when we talked to investors, we didn't say, oh, you know, this is a 17% IRR. We said we're trying to get Banner 17, and we're going to do what it takes to do that. Now, what's happened in those 20 years, as Jerry knows, because he was uh, on, on the other side of all, a lot of this, uh, for, for my career, at, at, you were at Goldman. Um, what's happened is, is the kind of media rights have exploded. Uh, the team valuations have gone up because of the revenues have gone up so much. And the technological change has been stunning. When we bought the team, I don't even think we had the, we had the season ticket holders on email. There, 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 was no, uh, uh, there was no Twitter X now. Uh, there was no Twitter, no X, no, no Facebook. Uh, so, so there was very little engagement except going to the games or watching games on TV. So what's happened in the last 20 years has been an explosion of social media, which has promoted fan engagement. And finally, I'll say that, that what Jerry was talking about, the streaming technology, the technology that's come, come online now, when we, we bought the Celtics, you'd count, you'd count your fans in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, Manchester United is counting fans in you know, close to a billion now. And so the sports like soccer and, and basketball that are global sports now have a huge new market. When, when I go to Italy to see an Atalanta game, I see people in Celtics jerseys. You, know, you go to Barcelona, you see people in Celtics jerseys. So, Wait, does that mean they're your fans? No, it just means that there's lots of people that have Celtics or Lakers or, or, or NBA jerseys in all of Europe. Because I didn't they, know if they were following you. Yeah, well, hopefully they do too. <laughs> but, 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 but you see them everywhere. And that's a huge difference from, from the, only the year 2003 we bought the team where there was very little you know, global recognition. In the NBA today, about close to a quarter of the players come from overseas. So now you have a huge market. I think uh, Adam Silver and David Stern were way out ahead of this, opening up offices in Europe and China and, and, and having a league in, in, in Africa. So these global games you know, have, have really increased the reach and the valuation has gone up. And then finally, I'd say uh, it's a scarce asset. There are only a certain amount of Serie A, Premier League, NBA, NFL teams out there, a small number compared to a large number of people who would like to invest. And so that's driven the values up as well, just, just like a... A Picasso painting that used to cost 10 million now costs, you know, 600 million. You know, Rich, it also used to be that when we talked about sports, we were talking about baseball, basketball, and football. And that's pretty much sums it up. That is not the case at all in the world we're living in. Give me a sense of your investments and the way that you're investing to grow other sports. Yeah, I mean, my approach to it and the point of view that I have is going to be completely different than the two of them. And I think it's an interesting set of panelists because the three of us do have a completely different approach and perspective and position and where we sit. For us and for like the things that you guys said, obviously being in the sports world, seeing these valuations explode the way they have um, and seeing the creative possibilities for people to enter into these cap tables has made all of, let's say, me and Kevin's peers in the sports and media landscape interested in it. It's always been a pipe dream for a lot of athletes things that they thought about doing post-career. What we realized during the pandemic was when sports was completely taken away from the consumer and then introduced again through sports like cornhole and lacrosse, I realized quickly that the fan bases were as ravenous as fan bases around these major professional sports, yet smaller, that the athletes were the best in the world at what they did, and that sponsors and, and different competitive stakes existed in the same way but that now all of a sudden there was a value on these sports returning. So I saw this as not anything that was going to compete with the major sports leagues, but for a way for us to get some exposure and visibility into sports teams and leagues, for us to build our brand and create a flywheel of community with some of these emerging leagues. And then also as an asset class in itself, I was bullish on it. I was bullish on the opportunities around women's soccer, around uh, a startup volleyball league, around the sport of pickleball, which Yesterday just had a merger and increased values for the teams we bought two years ago. So it's a totally different perspective, but it's been great intel for us as we look to do things like these two gentlemen are doing in the future. And also, as valuations have increased and as these guys are 
bringing on private equity on the cap tables and you have to create revenue models and they're turning into entertainment assets, it means that having a more diversified cap table of people that can bring other value to a, an organization I think has become imperative too. Is there a, is there a minimum that you look for when you're looking at other sports? I mean, w would you invest in card jitsu or m mini golf tournaments? I don't know what card jitsu is. Uh, yeah, but, it was new to me too, but yeah. apparently it's a rabid fan base of people who watch jujitsu unfolding in a car. And the, the key, and I might be good at this actually, is you cannot let your opponent unbuckle their seatbelt because then they're free to whack you. Yeah, well, maybe, but I've looked at everything. I've looked at cycling. You have I've to be looked, a big car for Kevin, Kevin Durant. Yeah, there. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I think there's value in the communities around a lot of those sports. Um, and I think for us, from a media perspective, it's been interesting to grow our platform off the backs of some of those communities and be able to tell stories that those sports and those athletes wouldn't normally get. But again, I also think it's allowed us to position ourselves to understand a bit of the major sports landscape and even our investment in MLS, the valuation that we got in five years ago is, you know, a third of what the market valuation is now. But more importantly, we were able to get under the hood and add true real value, which I think is important as these teams have to find differentiators, have to create new revenue streams. You, you know, the, the, uh, Rich is right, but there's also there's a, still a commonality across the three of us in terms of the attributes that you discussed that, you know, it, 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 you have the, the, the really big stuff, you've got the emerging stuff, you know, they're all, it's all the same attributes. Um, the returns trajectories, the size of capital that it is attracted to it may differ. Um, you know, frankly, I think, you know, and risk is different. I think there is risk in what Steve and I do, right? Because it's inflated in my view, and I've got to constantly navigate to figure out how I can, you know, um, get the kind of risk adjusted returns that I get paid for. And, you know, your risk is just earlier stage. Yeah. And, and but, the, but the great thing about it though, is that, you know, these are great convening events and the way technology is evolving is that this is getting more distributed, more real time, Younger people today want more interactivity. And you know, so that's how this is all evolving. And I've always been of the view that if you start with the right intellectual property, you, you know, technological disintermediation and change can be a friend, not a foe. And that's what I think will we'll, you know, link. What's the risk? Like, where, where are you seeing current risk in investing in these? Look, the risk is, you know, I, I, the, the risk is uh, mispricing this. I like mean, Chelsea would be. Yeah, well, go ahead. Look, I mean, the, the risk is there is a tremendous amount of capital now that wants exposure to this. And I would just say that the risk comes from um, everyone gets lumped in, for example, as private equity, right? Well, uh, you know, I, I personally, I don't think what I do is private equity, right? And so... Uh, what do you think of it as? Well, I build businesses and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm more aligned with sort of a liberty media model than I am with a private equity. Private equity model, my stuff, when I, when I invest in these things, I want them all talking to each other. I want to then diagram them. Uh, I'm constantly skating to where the puck's going, and I look at these value chains and these ecosystems, and I see, I look for where there's dislocation, and then I try to go in and use capital and an integrated operating capability to close those gaps or those dislocations. That's not, that's not better or worse. It's just a different type of model. You know, private equity is churning through funds and trying to get money to work, and you know, I would just say with sports, that where the risk is, and I'd be curious to see what Steve and Rich think about this. You know, the risk comes from really mispricing. Every, everyone's jumping in. And what I don't like is I don't want the price set for me. I want to be able to set the price. And, you know, right now I can sit on the sidelines and not participate, but then you, you can't make money if you don't participate. So you got to put the money to work, right? So it's just I'm finding it harder than ever for me to find ways to invest and create a risk-adjusted return profile that I'm comfortable with, because a lot of the stuff that's getting said is being set by others who don't yeah, have. I the think same it's got to be. It's got to be. Long, it's really different than private equity. Jerry's right about that. Uh, you know, private equity has fun lives and and return criteria. This is much a longer-term investment, I, I would say. Yes. And you have to take advantage of specific knowledge to expand the product line to, to make the team win more. So, for example, uh, the Celtics uh, stat group, which is fantastic, the NBA has really helped the Atalanta build a stat group. They don't really have that many. Jerry's bringing it in Italy. We brought it into Italy to ter in terms of how to compete better, how to find better players, how to identify talent. Um, and so I agree with Jerry that an integrated model that has kind of a, 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 a management overview is the way to go with a very long time horizon, and especially with the prices that are, that are at these levels now. Luckily, we got in 20 years ago, and even two or three years ago with Atalanta, it, it, the prices have gone you know, skyrocketed. And again, to your point, 
the streaming and, and now the, the accessible X media exposure is helping the smaller sports find that following. Mm -hmm. And some will break through and some won't break through. And, and you'll probably have more that break, break through than don't. And that's, that's how you have these successes. Well, the other thing that's interesting is, you know, um, a, a lot of really smart, capable people, you know, um, that aren't, aren't funds, aren't sovereigns, you know, are getting priced out of, you know, these things. I mean, to buy an NFL team today, you kind of have to be like a Desi billionaire. Right, and well, so, but especially a lot because of they're not allowing private equity to buy in. Yet, you, do you see that changing? Yes. When? I don't know about when, but I, I think that you know, again, um, so far you've seen a linear progression in these asset valuations. I don't think that can continue on that kind of linear trajectory if they don't evolve the type of capital that is able to come into these things. You know, the, Euro the European football that you know, Steve and I are exposed to. I mean, that's the Wild West, right? And the quid pro quo on that is the transfer market and relegation, right? Um, and no salary caps, all, all this other stuff. So It's death defying. It, it is, right? Go ahead. Uh, question for you. The, the concern about these linear valuations, does that take into account what is also becoming obvious about the kind of diversified ways in which you can create value and mm -hmm. revenue, which I think is one of the issues with having such a high threshold for people to join the cap table. In the leagues like the NBA and the NFL where they want diversified cap tables, they're making it impossible for entry. And then those same people, I think, are the type of owners that can bring a new perspective totally to agree. how to build business and generate to revenue. Totally agree. I, I think, I think the, the really big pricey stuff should find ways for this kind of new generation that may, not, that may be priced out of an NFL team. We should find ways for them to participate. I mean, one of the things I've been trying to do is is on the player side i've been fascinated for some time about you know bringing players into the equation right and so i mean t i've always said that you know sports is a very simple ecosystem it's players teams and leagues all of the capital to date has gone here none of the capital has gone here right now we created a company a few years ago called one team where we corporatized the licensing revenues of the unions the player unions for the nfl and major league baseball uh and, it, and that was before nil really hit and then it really took off and then it sort of pulled back a bit you know, what, what Live is about is putting the players in golf at the economic table. I think you're going to start to see more of that. Does that change the way the teams will run to? If you have the talent in the room with the managers or mm -hmm. the executives, I'm asking because I also work in an industry where mm -hmm. the talent is very mm -hmm. separate from mm -hmm. the stakeholders. Uh, do, does it change the way the business runs? Mm -hmm. well, look, I, I'm not sure. It, I'm not sure it changes the way the business runs, but what it puts on the table in front of everybody is you can't have games without the players. And by the way, the players can't have games without ownership and leagues. You can't have a movie without Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. And so the question is, you know, how do we get more distributed economic participation for all the constituents in the value chain? And again, you know, that's, that's a contra that could be a controversial thing. We have unionized players in America. You have collective bargaining agreements and all this stuff. And Steve, I, I, yeah, I know it's a little controversial, but I mean, it's, you know, there's elements of, like what Rich does is bringing players into the ecosystem, but there's no formalized way of doing it. Yeah, you have to be very thoughtful about it because you think about right. a situation where if, um, uh, LeBron James, you know, buys into the Los Angeles Lakers, right. and then he gets traded right. to the Boston Celtics. Totally. Uh, you know, what are people going to think when 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 the Boston Celtics are playing the totally. playing the Lakers? But I think there are ways around that, and I've been generally supportive of the players getting the more economically they're involved, the better it is for the leagues. So there are ways to do it where you could create a basket of some percentages of the teams, and you have all the players participate buy into that basket. Now some players. Would, would say, I don't want to do that because I'm taking risk with the money. And, and, and they're, they're actually, uh, the, the NBA, NFL, have, NBA has very high salaries. So they might want, want to, but I, I, I would welcome that because it really gets them you know, more involved with the game, uh, more educated about the business. And, and uh, I think it would be great for the game. But you really have to watch out for the unintended consequences. Yes. You know, if people are getting traded and moved around or you know, some players won't like some player that owns part of the team because you know they're they're playing on the same team they don't own. Well, even yeah. longevity, you got to find a way for the next generation of players to be able. To, there's got to be a. Oh, the, the thing I haven't been able to figure out is how do we create a mechanism where the current players get to participate, and then the new players come in. When those players retire, they sort of cash out a little bit, and then the new players come in, and it sort of rejuvenates itself. Yeah. You know, it's like an ESOP of some form. Well, that's what I was going to say. I I do agree with you there. There's probably some very tricky consequences with having players currently economically involved. While I do think in some of these emerging leagues, an investment we made in an organization, Athletes Unlimited, is built just on that 
thesis that the players should own a part of it. But for the major professional sports leagues, I think one of the issues is take the NBA, for instance. The NBA is a superstar friendly league. Adam, David have been very upfront about that. It's worked. Uh, the stars drive so much of the halo around the NBA and the owners. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but the reality is, is Michael Jordan's been the only owner, Magic, very few exceptions, that have had creative situations built for them to be able to invest in some of these teams. Michael Jordan sells out, and then scarily for the NBA, they all of a sudden have no diversified uh, representation on cap tables. So for LeBron, Kevin, and Steph, to be able to have an entry point to retire and go into one of these organizations and not have to necessarily have to stand by the 1% rule, which would be $500 million for some of these guys, even for LeBron and Steph and Kevin is too much. Um, but all of a sudden, I think just that allows the players in the league to feel a part of it, even without owning a piece of it, even without having any economic connection, to know that the players that help kind of at the inflection point of this sport over the last 30 years turn into what it is now, to see these guys graduate into it is what's inspiring enough for the players to feel part of it. But, you know, it's interesting though, if that's 1% ownership is a barrier of entry to the star athletes, it's certainly a barrier of entry to other investors in the pool as well. Should those min minimums be changed? And two, what about going public and having IPOs of more teams. Could we see that? And then everybody gets a chance at okay. equity ownership. I think, I think you will see that. You will see that just because of the law of large numbers. It's mm -hmm. very, as, as Jerry was saying, if teams are selling for five, six, seven, you know, eight billion, it's difficult to find any one person that's going to take, take that on. No, not many people would take, let's say somebody has 10 billion, they wouldn't put seven billion into one team. So it's a very, very small list. And so you're going to have to have the capital uh, table expand and public is a way. Uh, Madison, the Knicks are, are already public, so it, it can be done. What about the fact that we're seeing it from sovereign wealth funds? I mean, the Saudis are going in, they, they're, they're shaking up golf, they're doing it with um, football, uh, European football, soccer. Mm -hmm. is, that, is it a good thing? Does it create new challenges or new hurdles for sports ownership? Look, I, I, think, I think new entrants, as long as they're responsible, is a good thing. I think, you know, the, 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 the global balance of power economically is shifting to the Middle East right now. I think having them in the world systems of these leagues is a positive. I really do. Uh, I, think, I think guys like us can be helpful to them, and they can be helpful in, in return. But, you know, with Steve's point, you know, about the, you know, the Celtic shirts, I mean, sports is becoming really global. Uh, and that's a huge positive. I mean, you know, when you look at European football now can be streamed directly into America. The question is, what's, what, what's, what does that mean for Major League Soccer? Mm -hmm. And you know, what's amazing to me is that the world's biggest economic power is not cut into the biggest sport in the world. That, that doesn't make any sense. And of course, the, I think the Europeans resist having the Americans involved, and they're missing the point. I think, what you, I think the, the answer is, is that the Americans getting involved in European football and world football is going to increase that pie dramatically, and, and everyone's going to benefit. How much does the narrative around single athletes drive the opportunity for return on investment? For instance, Lionel Messi coming. I went to a game in Inter Miami. That guy did not show up and play, though. I mean, I spent a fortune on the ticket, and then his muscles hurt. I'm like, my muscles hurt every day, and I still get up and go to work. I'm not even a the, pro the, athlete. The, uh, you know, I think the Messi uh, yeah. deal is a very interesting deal. You know, Apple was very creative. Eddie Q at Apple that engineered that thing. Um, and I think they're about double the subscriptions of what they thought they would be. He's become a phenomenon. Now, that was done with Pele back in uh, 1980. What was Cosmos. Pele? 70s? 70s? Yeah. Uh, Pele was the same thing. This is another iteration of that to get more viewership. I agree with Jerry. It's, it's all going to at some point have to combine a little bit if the, if the United States is going to be up in football. And you're seeing players from the U.S. go over there now. And you're seeing European players come over to the, to the MLS. The MLS has, has, has a league that has salary restrictions. So, that, so it's kind of like you know, the NBA is where, where the players go because that's where the money is. The Premier League, the, the Serie A is where the money is. That's where the players go. So, so MLS is going to have to expand their, their capability in terms of paying the players. And then you're going to have to see more cross movement. And eventually, you know, there'll be kind of a global situation. The problem, MLS's biggest problem is that unlike every other sport in America, we are just so far inferior as a league. So I don't know how much Americans are willing to 
invest into the sixth best soccer league in the world. And we're owners uh, have 10% stake in the Philadelphia Union, and we're considered to have one of the best farm systems. We've developed talent. One of the biggest revenue streams for us is transferring talent. But there's one Messi. There's three of them. There's Mbappe, Messi, Ronaldo that could do that. I think the concern is, is that the storytelling around the football players and the soccer players in America can't connect. They just can't connect with the consumer. What are American women's soccer players doing better than They're American the best men. in the world. And I think the thing that I was so excited about with the NWSL is it had all the variables. It just didn't seem to be a very well-run business, but it was the best women in the world. The fan bases were ravenous. They would sell exhibitions and have 100,000 people in the stadium. So to me, and the price of entry was very low. To me, I was really excited about that and can see the trajectory in some ways far greater than the MLS, which I'm still very excited about. But I think that's where I worry about a linear path. But right. yeah, people are attracted to great talent, and and uh, one of the most watched things uh, was the shootout, Villanescu and and, uh, and 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 Steph Curry at the All Star game, <laughs> and so you're seeing I think a justified explosion in women's sports because they are the best in, in several leagues, leagues in the United States. You combine that with the technology that that allows them to be distributed now, and so there's huge upside. Yeah. And then and then again you go back to the fact that. I think uh, 10 of the top 10 programs last year were all sports events mm -hmm. on the networks, mm -hmm. and they're all competing for these sports events, and people are really starting to get into the women's sports as it gets exposure and becomes exciting. You have, you have people like Clark out there. Um, so there's a lot of upside in that area. I, you, you bring up so many threads that I want to chase, but <clears throat> first, on the, on the money and the, and the media, the importance of media, we had talked a little bit about how the lucrative media contracts started driving the valuation of the teams higher. But legacy media is operating in an ad pressured environment. Money's tight. Do you anticipate, I mean, you, here you are with the Celtics watching the NBA going through negotiation of its broadcast rights in 2014, when they did the deal, it was worth $24 billion. Now my colleague, Julia Borston says, the NBA is looking for roughly 75 billion. Is that outrageous at a time when, you know, these companies are like, no, you can't travel. No, we've got to cut heads. We, we're operating in a different world. Uh, yeah, I think 7.5 billion, I, I think. The issue is programmers want programming that people will watch. And you're not going to get eyeballs unless you have this programming. That's why we've had the streaming wars and the content wars. And f fortunately, sports are at the catbird seat in that because they're the most watched programming. So you have that competition. If you're a network and you lose NFL or you lose NBA, your whole ratings go down. So th that's the battle that's going on right now. And I think someone's going to win that battle and there's going to be consolidation. Yes. Uh, they can't go on like this to have the consumer can't have 20 streaming services that they're paying between 10 and 40 bucks a month for. It just it doesn't work. So you're going to see consolidation. There'll be opportunity, and Jerry works in this consolidation in the next you know, five years, I think, I a lot of consolidation. I completely agree with Steve. I, I think this part of the conversation is about the return of the bundle. And I, and I had been saying for a while, I think the, the, the demise of the bundle was greatly over-exaggerated. What you saw with ESPN and Warner and, and Fox is the fact that, you know, what, what, that one of the structural challenges we're having in sports globally uh, is a phenomenon of all these changes right now. The, the consumer needs a value proposition. These things are becoming more and more expensive, and only the really rabid fan is going to subscribe to 18 different streaming services. The, 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 the more normalized fan is going to want the best value proposition to get the best stuff. And what's happening there is that there's an increasing divergence between the best stuff and, and the less premium stuff. And they're all valid. But you know, I'm, I don't know what you guys see, but I, I see you know, the, the, the big markets versus the small markets. I see the haves versus the have-nots. I see the Premier League versus the continent of Europe. And it per permeates down, and, and, it's a, and it's a circularity. You know, the Premier League is where it is, where it is relative to continental Europe uh, because they attract the best players, because they have the highest media contracts. And it just sort of feeds itself, right? And you've had the great corporatization of ownership in England between sovereigns and oligarchs and, and funds. And in, in continental Europe, I mean, you know, th frankly, the only two institutional owners in continental Europe are me and in Qatar, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, Milan and Paris. Everyone else, I mean, Steve's unbelievable. I mean, Steve's one of the best owners in all of sports. 
he, most of the owners in, on continental Europe are individuals. And it's, and it's you know, and particularly with the transfer market and relegation, it's really hard to compete against corporatized ownership. So th this has to get normalized because the, the, everyone, you know, the great thing about capitalism is it's going to keep pushing it to the edge. The thing, though, about sports is if you look at it, on, if you look at it objectively, about terminal value appreciation as an investor, you've got to have really healthy competition. And you know, this competitive this, balance is competitive key. balance is absolutely right. Wouldn't you say? I mean, in Syria, we have 20 teams. Yeah. You know, we want that to be, we, we don't want the same, as much as I would like AC Milan to be number one every year. It, it, if you're looking at it unobje just objectively, you would want a much more distributed competitive balance. And you, you just want to be able to buy. That's for, why the NFL has been a leader and so exactly. successful because yeah, well, you, you have like different winners PSG. every year, and the NBA is getting to be like that now, too. Does a brand like PSG get affected by something like that? It's a great point. I mean, you know, they, Nasser has done a phenomenal job with PSG, but they're number one every, every year. year. Now, what's interesting about that is they had Mbappe, Neymar, and Messi, and they still didn't win. Yeah which I frankly think is a good thing. I, I think that shows you that you can't, you know, the days of Silvio Berlusconi and George Steinbrenner are, have evolved now and they're over. You can't buy championships yeah. anymore. It's just, so there's good and bad, but you're absolutely right. It would definitely Wait, impact that. I do think that while the media deal in its like current form may look like it has a ceiling, obviously what those three did by merging and creating more optionality for the fan was great. I think that's a bit of a response to the fact that the broadcast cable consumer was over it, right? They refused to pay that amount of money just to watch live sports. So here became an option. But I do think, and especially in America, where there's opportunity, where those numbers may not have to come down, is in the creativity of how you can structure these offerings. Because the NBA, for instance, could sell player packages. They created the in-season tournament to create a whole new asset. I mean, the NBA is always ahead of the curve in how they're thinking about it, but by creating the play-in tournament, the in-season tournament. Mm -hmm. These are standalone IP and assets that you can sell for different uh, media packages. So I, I still see that those numbers could continue to grow, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and look, those numbers will continue to globalize. Uh, it's, 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 the technology is highly to the advantage of the big sports that are global sports, which is soccer and, and, uh, and uh, basketball yeah. at this point. And right. you know, cricket's evolving. Cricket's yeah. a huge uh, success in India, in England. Now it's starting to come to other places as well. Yep. What about sports betting? How does that increase the opportunity for a return? Look, I, I, it's theoretical at this point because I think the states have, have overshot and have taken too much. Of, they priced it. They price guys like me out of it. Um, so theoretically, yes, it's definitely going longer term. I think that will normalize and it will be another, another part of the revenue stream around the monetization of the IP. I don't, I, I'd be curious to see what you think, Steve. I don't see an entry point for, for this kind of capital right now in that. You know, the, well, sports betting now in the United States is being dominated by DraftKings and Fanatics is getting into it and FanDuel. Um, I think sports betting uh, is, is actually good because people watch the games longer, there's more points of interest, it brings more people in, involved, and we can see it in the numbers, you know, viewership is up. And even the way the broadcasts are framed now, you're having, you know, betting lines underneath. Um, there's obviously a lot of risk with that. You don't want fixed games. You know, the NBA has done a great job of policing that, and they're going to really have to have a great policing of all that. They've done, a, they've done pretty well in Europe. There hasn't been too many scandals on sports betting. It's an accepted thing, and it's a fun part of the game. So I think, again, to your point, it's only going to be another source of revenue as we go on, and it'll create, it'll create more fans. The interesting thing is that, you know, here at a sports analytics conference, the data providers for the leagues – are finding that there is a market for their information, not just with the sports books, but then to go back to the teams and sell that data that did not exist before you started putting cameras on helmets and you know, I, I don't the various ways that they're collecting data and that and the speed with which the algorithms can churn out what happens next. So so the it's not just about fan engagement; it's also about team ownership, isn't it, at about how much better the teams can perform having that data at their fingertips? I think it's, uh, it's critical to success. And it's kind of, you know, you're never going to lose the human element. Be I, I think AI could not coach the team because the coaches see things that I, I don't know if AI will ever see. But it's just like anything else when, when, uh, when we all, went, well, I'm going to date myself, but we were using slide rules, you know, you know back, back in college to do, to do math. And they brought the HP 12C in. People said, oh, people won't be able to do the math. It actually enhanced the capabilities. Right. So this is enhancing the capabilities of our scouts and general managers 
to make uh, bigger bets, and these players are more and more expensive right now, to make bigger and more accurate bets. Um, and then Less risky? Are those bets less risky because of the data? Absolutely, ab absolutely. It, it can really help you at, at the margin, and everything's at the margin. You know, as Jerry knows, if you're like 3% better, that's the difference between winning and losing in, the, in these leagues in Serie A and the NBA. So the people that can do that best at the margin, they're, the, they're gonna succeed more than the people that can't. I have a question for you guys. Uh, when you look at these valuations, um, and as you think about the risk in getting into it, I've noticed that there's a lot of owners, especially in America, that are starting to look at the ownership in a sports team as the platform for the business they build around mm -hmm. it. So you see mm -hmm. real estate development, mm -hmm. hotel development, hospitality development. I would say, A, is that the new vision for a sports team over owner, especially when the state or city could be paying for their arena? And then second of all, does that in turn allow valuations potentially to have a new source of revenue to Great question. build valuation? I, I absolutely believe that. I mean, you, you framed it really well. I, I, I th I've been saying for a while, I think sports team ownership uh, is a partnership with music. It's a partnership with uh, the monetization of the live event, real estate. Uh, and so, you know, it, it provides a way for you to buy down the overpay on the way in. And then, as you said, it rejuvenates the trajectory to be able to underwrite that, that linear escalation. And so I think it's a real positive. It's a, sports team ownership today is a multidisciplinary approach. And you got to, you know, I'm finding in, in Milan, we're going to hopefully be the first team in Syria to build a new stadium since 2011. The challenge is in Syria is that we're, we want to build an American stadium, 70,000 seats. Um, but I know I can't charge American pricing in Italy. So how are you going to do that? You know, in America, you can charge $5 million for a corporate suite. You, I created Legends Hospitality to be able to do all this kind of stuff. You can't do that in Italy, right? And so if guys like Steve and I want to come to Italy and, and, and you know, try to accelerate their curve to be able to be more competitive with the Premier League, our, 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 the tools and levers we have are, are not 100%. They're sort of mitigated. Yeah. But what you said, I think, is absolutely the case. Yeah, an example is the commanders. You know, there's a big uh, real estate component right. in that valuation of the land around Washington, the stadium rebuild, and all the rest of it. So that's going to have to be, become part of it. And uh, uh, I think you know, there was a spate of uh, college professors in literature that said that stadiums weren't accretive. They actually are. It, it's proven to be accretive. The things that are going on at the Olympics in LA, it's going to be a massive success. Uh, and when you do these projects associated with the stadium and rebuild around the area, you know, it can be it can great for the community, it's great for the team, and it helps the valuations as well. I mean, the thing that's interesting is Formula One. I mean, when you look at Formula One across all these other sports, it's, it's not really a sport in the definition of it's the a, NBA. It's a party. It's a convening event. Yeah, of brands. No, 100%. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, and so when you go to a Formula, it's the paddock club. Right. Yeah. And that's interesting, I think. Right. Because there's elements of that which we can all apply in the more mainstream sports to your to, right to but your can, point. Richard. But do you feel sorry, do you feel restricted by the league ever when you look at right? Because if someone said to you, I'm going to give you this Boston Celtic team, here's the stadium, here's the history, here's the stars. What's the ceiling of this business you think you could build? You would never say $8 billion. You'd think you could turn that into a $100 billion company. Well, that's why Steve's point on longevity is really important. Yeah. You can't <laughs> own these time. things like a private equity firm in and out in five years. Yeah. Totally. It's got to be a, a long-term strategy, and, and that, would be, that would be the build. And, uh, but again, I think values will go up. But, but just looking at all the markets, um, it's, it's much harder... It's much easier to go from 300 million to 3 billion than it is to go from 3 billion to 30, 300, it's to yeah. 30 and then 300. But, so there's this, it's called the law of large numbers. But to your point, Rich, what we saw with the family of the founder of Las Vegas Sands, which is the world's largest casino company, buying the majority stake in the Mavericks is not about, it's not just about the Mavericks and what they bring to the table, it's also about the real estate around it, and mostly it's about convincing Texas mm -hmm. to legalize gambling, that they're a good partner, that they're committed to the future of Texas. Let us demonstrate it with ownership of the, of the Mavericks. Um, and, and, and an interesting mm -hmm. development, of course, they've had Tillman Fertitta there, and, and he owns teams and casinos. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, I've got so many questions coming in from the audience now that I just want to um, a few minutes early, start to get to some of these. Um, it says, how do you add teams to your portfolio and what synergies do you find across teams? I think to your point where it's not just a siloed investment, 
Can you talk a little bit about your strategy when you go to look at new investments? Yeah, absolutely. We try to look for things uh, like Jerry does that are a good value. They're not just priced on, uh, uh, you know, a top of the bubble because we believe you have to invest in these teams. So we invested into Atalanta besides buying the club. We invested in more players. We've we've uh, renovated the stadium. We'll, we'll complete the renovation of the stadium uh, this June. It'll be one of the best stadiums in Italy. It's, it's smaller. It's more like Fenway Park. It's 25,000 seats, but we're able to build luxury boxes and parking amenities for the, for the fans there. Um, and and so so and our philosophy is you can bring the statistics to bear, the marketing, the corporate relationships, and when you can do all that and buy something at a reasonable price and decide to invest in it, you know that's the kinds of things we look at. Look, I think the the, the great thing about the, these assets is you don't necessarily need to add another asset. You need to really, you know, build around the existing asset that you have. So Fenway Sports Group, when we bought into that. Um, you know, we did it because we thought it was one of the best ownership and management teams in the industry. They started with a diverse multi-sport platform in Liverpool, the Red Sox, and New England Sports Network. Then we added the Penguins. Then we have this real estate project going on in LA, in uh, Las Vegas, uh, uh, with a group of partners um, where you know we can build a live gaming campus like LA Live and hopefully attract an NBA expansion team. You know, so so I, I what I love doing is is finding great platform investments that in and of themselves, if you just did that, would be a good return. But then work those investments, right? Add to them, use them to enable you to buy other things and, and put them in or build other things and buy down your average cost. And the richest point, you know, increase the longevity of your trajectory from a return standpoint. That's much more interesting to me. And again, to what I said earlier, ours is clearly totally different. So there's kind of two ways that we would look at it. One for some of these more emerging uh, sports leagues and teams, I'm trying to build a business and a brand in boardrooms. So when I look at some of these investments, obviously I would like to understand what my investment risk is, if I think I could trade this investment at any point in the next five to 10 years. But also, like I said, does this create some type of community that can, I can grow off of? So Gotham FC being in New York, women's soccer being something that I was a fan of, and this team winning the championship and the community they built, it's been something that I've worked closely with and it's helped both our organizations grow. And then I think on the second part of it, it's truly, and jokes aside, it's when I have an opportunity with individuals like this that see the value in adding a strategic investor. And for me, when I do that, it's pretty much filtered to us already at that point. I have to make sure that I think I can add value. Again, if I think there's an opportunity to trade in the future, I'm not doing it to just park that money forever, but it's really to start getting exposure and be on cap tables with you know, gentlemen like this. So for us, that's been our strategy. That's why we own so many of these emerging sports. And I know they all won't work. I do feel strongly about a few of them, but I do think that it's the means to where we're trying to go. And it's also been a great support to some of these, to these leagues that need that, you know, needed investors like us that were really ready, ready to commit storytelling and audience and community around a league that never normally got it. We, we briefly touched on women's sports, you know, the the power of women's soccer, WNBA seeing an, you know, really incredible growth in terms of fan engagement. Where do you see women's sports going and how does that create new opportunities for investors, Steve? Is, is Boston gonna get a WNBA team? Well, yeah, we're certainly considering it and women's sports, I think is gonna be a big growth area for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, as, as these gentlemen said, that people wanna watch the best and the American women are the best in, in many sports. Um, and again, I can't stress enough how the technology change has allowed these sports to get exposure and then you get exposure and then you build the league from exposure. And I think it's really good what MLS is doing with the Apple deal, uh, bringing in Messi, doubling the, doubling the base, and then hopefully that'll, that'll catch fire so there's more revenues and they can bring in bigger players c coming in and, and then the US leagues will have some more parity to, to the other leagues. But I think women's sports is in that same category it was an underexploited asset because uh, the technology didn't allow for it. It didn't allow uh, cheap, cheap uh, uh, broadcasting of the games. Now you have that with streaming and the different packages and the different programming that has to go on. And the programming wars itself between the old media and the new media is going to fuel investment in sports so that they'll catch on, so that they'll, they'll, you'll watch that network. What do you think is the, the next big sport to see explosive growth, Rich? Um, volleyball. I mean, on a, like on a smaller scale, I think volleyball as 
uh, a sport across all of these kind of secondary sports that I mentioned has the most viability. Um, and I'm still very bullish on MLS. I mean, the World Cup is coming here. They have the World Championships, I think, the year before. Obviously, the Apple deal, while it may not have been the most lucrative deal for the league, it created an incredible partner and somebody that was willing to be creative. And they were very creative with Messi. I think it's very cool how they've engaged the teams to build their own communities and their own icons within the MLS app on the Apple channel. I think that's something that a lot of teams would love to be able to do on the, on the bigger leagues, to have a direct-to-consumer communication and be able to stream games and communicate directly with your fans that way. But um, I think, again, volleyball, I think, has a real possibility. Uh, this one is specifically for Jerry. Regarding the point that sports aren't ready to be its own asset class, can you speak to how the constrained supply of major league teams, coupled with the oligopoly of broadcast rights, impacts that path to asset class status? And do you think that they can be overcome? Yeah, look, my, my, my point was simply that, um, you know, there, it's a high bar when, you, when, when they, a lot of these terms get thrown around. And when, when I start to hear that sports is now an asset class, I, I, it, it, I take a pause uh, because as someone who's been investing in sports for close to 30 years, you know, I, I, I don't think it's ready yet to be an asset class, but that's not a ding on sports. I mean, you oh, know, But every, what do you think about Bitcoin, Jerry? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. That's an asset class. Yeah, exactly. Sports may be a better asset class well, than, it's, than it's Bitcoin. Funny you, it's funny you say that. You know, it, it, the real answer, Contessa, is that um, the people who are giving sports the moniker of asset class, I think, are, is the new capital that's shown up. Guys like us who have been doing it for a while, it doesn't matter to us. We don't think about it as an asset class. That's, that's the terminology of outsiders to the sports ecosystem who are chasing portfolio construction and these facile notions that the thing keeps going up and it's not correlated to the macro and it outperforms the S&P. So it's an interesting thing it, to theorize about. It sounds about, to me like you're saying there's dumb money entering, <laughs> investing in sports. I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> What I'm going to say is there's different money, and everybody has legitimate objectives <laughs> for, for them. It's, they thought about that for the movie title, but it didn't yeah. have this different, different money. Yeah. Isn't there a, do you not believe in the premium that a lot of individuals feel like in just owning, it's worth it? Yeah, as I said. to own. Totally. Look, I mean, it's, everybody has different objectives, and that's fine. I mean, my, I, in my own slipstream, I have a job to do. Right? I'm a fiduciary for third-party capital, and I'm about... My style of investing is to arbitrage what we're talking about. I, I go into these ecosystems, and if there's a bubble, I arbitrage it, right? And so I'm, and, then, and what, it, what that normally means is it, I can't just buy something and sit on it. It means I'm going to have to get in there, and I really got to work it, and I got to go build, you know, or I create something from scratch, like Yes or Legends or On Location or any of these things. So to, it's, you know, it's, it's to each his own. I mean, everybody has different things. But, but I do think it's going to become an asset class. It has to because... Mm -hmm. Uh, the money is so large to buy Premier League teams, NFL teams, NBA teams, Major League Baseball. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to need institutional capital, number one. Number two, if you compare it to, to other things like gold or Bitcoin, it has never really gone down very much because there's always going to be a demand for people to watch the best people in the world play the sports that they love. So I think it has characteristics already of being an asset class, and it's going to be driven by the fact that uh, you know, you can't get liquidity in the teams with these large numbers unless it is a larger group of investors coming in. So it'll be sovereigns, uh, it'll be corporations, it'll be going public. If, the Celtics, if pension, the Celtics way back when were a, limited, a master limited partnership, they were probably the first example right. of something that was quasi-public. And people in that deal, I know the, the folks that sold it, they made a lot of money because most people didn't turn in their shares, they just kept them up on the wall. They right. bought them for $18, I think. And they could have sold them for uh, whatever it was, four or five hundred dollars, but they kept the certificate. You're totally right. Look, for again, let's look at it this way: for sports to, you know, really be redeemed, legitimately an asset class, the the type of capital attracting to it is got to evolve. And just one one little anecdote: you know, right now the only equity research for these multi-billion-dollar companies called sports teams is Forbes magazine. So, I'm, so why don't we just say this? When Goldman Sachs starts writing research on sports, on sports then, it, then it might be ready to be an asset class. Sportico. Right, <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, the other thing is, there is still something special about owning a piece of a team. I mean, you guys can talk about the business behind it and the return on investment and all of this, but come on, be honest. Isn't there something really cool about being a co-owner of the Boston Celtics? 
Absolutely. I mean, we, we, again, we, we go way back 20, 21 years ago. This was not a robust business. The business was losing money. Um, we wanted to put together a community group to win. And the, we had three objectives. One was to win a championship. Another was to make it a better fan experience because in the garden in those days, they didn't even have, they didn't have dancers. They didn't have, they had an organ, uh, you know, mm -hmm. playing. All the way up, yeah. And in the timeouts, there'd be dead silence. Right. You could hear crowd milling and, and people, you know, writing on scorecards. So, and the third thing was to, to, to improve the community. And we set up the Boston Celtic Shamrock Foundation um, and Boston Celtics United for Social Justice, which has invested millions of dollars back into the community. So that was, that was uh, we, we thought that was cool and, that, and, and we wanted a championship. I, I couldn't tell you that the values would go up so much in those 20 years, but it's a long-term approach. And now everyone has recognized the power of sports, the power for change, the power for real estate. And, and that's why it's, it's fun and it's cool. And it's, it's great to, you know, I pinch myself every day, you know, you know then, then, you know, have my idea about what should happen in something and actually be involved in it. It's, 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 it's incredible fun. It's incredible fun doing it. Jerry and I do it against each other in Italy. We're still, we're still friends, still friends to this, to this day, but, but we're doing it 40, probably like 50, 50 miles apart. In Italy, we have teams and that's an incredible amount of fun. And the fans there are as, as rabid or more rabid than the United States. And, and someone asked me, do they hate American owners? And they said, they don't hate American owners as long as they win. Right. So Jerry's winning now, we're winning now. We're, we're, we're very well liked. But Was there a difference though in investing? I mean, were you able to just transfer your knowledge of team ownership in the US to team ownership in Europe? It's the it's it, it's same thing? It's a process. It's, it takes time. You know, both Jerry and I are taking a long-term approach to these clubs. He's revolutionized the stadium. We, we're, we're renovating the stadium. We're investing more in statistics. We're investing in better player amenities. We're investing in better scouting. We're investing in analytics. And so, so th that doesn't happen in a day. And I think the biggest fallacy new owners have is if you come in and you say, we're going to do all this in one year and we're going to win, you know, then you get very bad situations because they end up uh, getting a 37-year-old player you know, for, for, for uh, 50 million a year that maybe has a half-life. They, they sign him up for four years in soccer, in, in, in the NFL, in, in the NBA. And, and that's a path towards kind of, kind of you know, short-term gratification, but long-term you can't build a team that way. So you gotta do it, he's done it, we've done it brick by brick, thoughtful strategy, thoughtful approach, and with all in the eye for the long-term of building value. And that's I mean, how you have to do the, it. The real adjustment in European football, at least from an American orientation, is that uh, the fan is really your partner. So you show up and you don't really have that in, in, in the States. Over there, that you're really partnered with them. What they're looking for, and I know this because I lived in Milwaukee, and you either join the Packers cult right. or you die, right. is that the, the families that bought stock in the Green Bay Packers, there was no financial benefit for them to do that, but there was pride and there was engagement, yeah. and, it, and it works for this team that plays in the, the frozen north. Surely it must work everywhere. And that is one thing quick, and I know we got to go, mm -hmm. for the globalization of sport is young consumers globally tend to follow players more so than teams in America, yes. whereas obviously it's different. Right. Like you said, the example of PSG is like Mbappe will leave, but the fan base right. will remain. So yep. I think that's just one thing that could be a headwind at some point. Coke wishes that all of its consumers were as rabid and, and committed. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Steve, Rich, Jerry. Great panel. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks, guys, guys, for your great attention.